Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Luis Fraga, Director of the Institute for Latino Studies and Professor of Political Science, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the seventh in our speaker series for Hispanic Heritage Month. I have the great pleasure of introducing someone who I call a friend, not just a professional acquaintance, but someone whom I trust, someone with whom I share a great deal of politics and political views, and someone who is a magnificent scholar. Jason Ruiz is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of American Studies at Notre Dame, where he also has affiliations with the Program in Gender Studies and the Institute for Latino Studies. His research focuses on the perceptions of Latin America, with an emphasis on race, culture, and economic imperialism, tourism, gender, and sexuality. His first book, Americans in the Treasure House, Travel to Porfirio in Mexico and the Cultural Politics of Empire, was published by the University of Texas Press. He's published in a number of major journals in American studies and elsewhere. He's edited two books, um, and he is a winner, a very important winner, of two major teaching awards at the University of Notre Dame. He's the recipient of the Edmund P. Joyce Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching in 2016, and more recently, the recipient of the 2019 Sheedy Award for Excellence in Teaching. His current book project is entitled Latinidad, excuse me, Narco Media, Latinidad, Popular Culture, and the War on Drugs, and he's been working on that very hard this past year. But today, just to give you a sense of the full range of Professor Ruiz's um, intellectual interests, he's going to talk to us about the Latinx murals of Pilsen in Chicago, a digital research project devoted to, the pu to public art in Chicago and supported by the Whiting Foundation. Jason, thank you so much for being with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Luis. That was really awesome to hear. Um, and thank you everyone who's joining us from today. As I mentioned, uh, when a few people were filtering in, we're quite an international crowd. It's amazing to see friends and acquaintances and colleagues from um, Colombia, the Netherlands, Mexico. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm really glad to be doing this, but especially for two reasons. The first is that I love ILS and I'll do anything for ILS ever. Uh, all they have to do is ask. Uh, ILS just supported me um, on a leave as well. And I really want to say, publicly say thank you again to Luis for that, for making my amazing year in Colombia possible as I worked on my book. Um, the second reason is that I've not had many opportunities to, to talk about this project in particular on campus. I'm always talking about my book project. That's what uh, people, you know, you sort of have to show Notre Dame that you're, you know, you're not going to get tenure and never write a second book. Um, so I'm always uh, convincing my colleagues of that. But uh, this has been a real passion project of mine, and I haven't had a chance to talk very much about it on campus. Uh, this is um, this project has really allowed me to learn so many other skills and to grow and stretch in a, a bunch of different ways. So I'm gonna, what you'll be hearing is very much a work in progress. Um, I was a little bit of a pain in the butt with Paloma because I uh, asked her if we could make this uh, Zoom meeting rather than a webinar because I, I love webinars. Thank you so much for staging the webinars, but I, I often feel like they're not as interactive as a Zoom meeting. So I really encourage you to, you can ask me a question in the chat, you can raise your hand. I might lose sight of it, but I will come back to you. I'd, I'd just love to make this interactive, partly because it is such a work in progress and I, I'm still learning and really could use some advice on this project. Uh, so I really do hope this can be a conversation. Uh, it is a work in progress. Uh, and your advice and feedback will be invaluable to me and will directly impact me as, as we continue on this. I'm going to use the word we a lot because, as you'll see, this has been a team effort. I'll be introducing some people uh, who have been working on this project as we go along the way. I probably won't get to everyone, but uh, I'm really, I, I'm not so arrogant that I use the word we to refer to only myself. Um, I use the word we also to refer to really show that this has been a collective effort and a a group project. This project really starts about 10 years ago when I was new and fresh faced here at Notre Dame. Uh, hard to remember a time like that. I was teaching one of my very first classes here, a class called Latinos in Chicagoland. 
Um, and of course, if you're going to, I'm from Chicagoland myself, I'm from East Chicago, Indiana, but of course, if you're going to talk about Latinos in Chicagoland, you have to talk about the Pilsen neighborhood. The Pilsen is really, I think, an iconic gateway community in, in Chicago history. It has been home to uh, many generations of Mexican Americans. Let me just go ahead and share my screen uh, so I can kind of get going on the presentation part. As I mentioned, in this class, I had to talk about the Pilsen neighborhood because Pilsen is so iconic and associated with Latinidad in Chicago. There's some interesting facts I can tell you about Pilsen today. Um, Pilsen is no longer the most Latino neighborhood in Chicago, demographically speaking, partly because uh, factors such as gentrification, as I'll be talking about a lot about in this presentation. Uh, it might surprise you that the most Latino neighborhood or segment of Chicagoland or really census tract in Chicagoland is now not even in Chicago anymore. Uh, it is now in the, in the inner ring suburb of Cicero, which has a thriving and large Mexican American community. Uh, so it's been really interesting to me that Pilsen remains iconically Latino. Here's Pilsen in the lower left quadrant of this map of the city of Chicago. Pilsen is no longer demographically the most Latino neighborhood in Chicago in, in terms of proportion, but it is iconically Latino in Chicago. And the murals that I'm going to talk a lot about in the presentation today play a major role in that. I would say that there's other neighborhoods that we also need to talk about in Chicago. There's Little Village, which is very close to Pilsen. There's the Humboldt Park neighborhood that has been home to generations of Puerto Rican migrants to the city. But I think if you had to ask a lot of people to name one Latinx neighborhood in Chicago, they might mention Pilsen. Uh, it, it's also worth noting that uh, Pilsen has become an important uh, tourism stop in a lot of Chicago tourism. I'm going to try not to use that other part of my brain and do a critical analysis of the word hood in this headline, although it's very tempting. Uh, but Pilsen itself is rapidly changing, as I'll talk a lot about in the presentation today, uh, partly because of this kind of touristic gaze that has been really shaping how people perceive Pilsen. So the takeaway from this first little preamble to my talk is that Pilsen no longer, statistically speaking, the most Latino neighborhood in Chicago, but iconically and uh, is associated with Latinidad in Chicago and is definitely um, associated with Chicago in the popular imagination. So back to about 10 years ago, I'm planning this class called Latinos in Chicagoland. And one thing that really stunned me is that there was very little scholarship on the murals themselves. There is a small but mighty scholarship, uh, body of scholarship on Latinos in the city of Chicago. Our former colleague, Micah Mesqua, is a scholar of that. Uh, Lilia Fernandez um, wrote this great book called Black and Brown in the Windy City that looked at some of the issues of Chicagoland. But Although the murals, I would say, are iconically associated with Pilsen, they've been really relegated to footnotes in the scholarship on Pilsen, which has really surprised me at the time. So a couple of years later, I was teaching a special summer course with um, another of our colleagues uh, in, uh, uh, who is affiliated with the Institute for Latino Studies, Anne Garcia Romero, who unfortunately is, has student meetings right now, although, or I would um, ask her to talk about this. But uh, we, for several years, we taught a summer class on uh, race and popular culture, and I started developing a walking tour of the Pilsen neighborhood as part of this. So it was a few years after that that I got a very interesting phone call from a friend of mine who works at Notre Dame, Jennifer Parker, who is the head of the architecture library and who's also the co-director and co-founder of a project called the Historic Urban Environments Lab. Hugh, I know that James Sweet is on this call. I think he's on this call still. He is, was, has been part of Hugh for a long time. He does um, the app development side of it along with many other tasks. Jennifer approached me and said, Hugh is devoted to examining the historic urban environment. And if we have time later, I'll show you some of their apps and some of the toys that they make, which are really incredible. Uh, they design app websites and apps so far that have looked at uh, the city of Rome in particular, uh, also um, the historic uh, side of South Bend. They have an app that has an amazing walking tour with built-in sound where you can walk through South Bend and learn about the 
the historic built environment of South Bend. And they're especially have also been interested in um, the seaside community, which is one of the United States first uh, planned mixed use uh, developments. Uh, on the Florida Panhandle. So very interesting stuff. I really never thought that Jennifer and I would have much to say to each other professionally, but she was asking if we could possibly use some of the technology that they've built, which again, I'll talk about a little bit uh, in, in a few minutes, if we could apply some of the technology that they've built uh, in terms of user interface on web and app uh, protocols uh, in, for to engage the public with information about the Latino murals in Pilsen. Obviously, for someone who's been teaching about this stuff and has been intellectually and pedagogically interested in the, the murals of Pilsen, this was an exciting opportunity to say there's very little out there to get deeper information about the murals. And I think it's a much needed, um, much needed source of information. So I've been working with Jennifer and the Hugh team for a few years now to, to develop a suite of digital tools that document and interpret Pilsen's rich public art traditions for diverse audiences. Okay, that is a really fancy way of saying what we're really doing. We are building an, a website and a mobile app that are devoted to the Pilsen murals. I'm going to talk just for a minute about the two sides of the, of the project. Um, on the one side, we're building a digital archive, which is the form of a website that will house research materials related to Pilsen muralism. Uh, these will, so you might be thinking, okay, a website, lots of people have websites. This is something totally different because our goal is really to put primary sources in front of people who are interested in researching the Pilsen neighborhood. We have users in mind from a kindergarten class to the PhD who's looking for primary sources for their dissertation. Uh, these might include video and transcripts of interviews with working artists, sketches of murals so that you can see them in various stages of conception to execution, and other materials that we think will deepen users' understandings of how murals got there, what they mean, and why they're important. Like I said, um, I'll talk in a little bit about our partnership with the National Museum of Mexican Art. And one thing that they get inundated constantly with information, with demands for information about murals from the school children of the Chicago Public Schools, for example. So this is kind of the web archive part of it is designed and really conceived as kind of one stop shopping for uh, primary sources related to the materials. The mobile app is really more of an interpretive apparatus. Um, you can picture an app that you can download onto your phone or your iPad that can guide you through customized walking tours that can uh, put your eyes and ears in front of um, artists talking to themselves. So we amass a huge amount of information that we make available on the, um, on the digital archive. And then what we do is we sort of translate that and we, um, we transcribe that into a mobile app that will take some of the greatest highlights of the, app, of the archive and put them in app form. Jennifer will slap me if she sees this recording and does not see me put it this way. Um, Jennifer's always telling me that the website is a tool for research and that mobile app is a tool for discovery. I should mention we've had some funders along the way. Um, Jennifer also, also taught me the value of money in terms of getting a research project like this off the ground. As, um, as Luis mentioned going in, uh, I've had support from the Whiting Foundation, a public engagement fellowship with them. And this has also been um, largely supported by the faculty research um, project here, at, a program here at Notre Dame. So along the way, uh, there's lots of moving parts of the project. Uh, there are, however, three, oh, there's Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> there's three um, non-negotiables I want to talk about. Jennifer, did I pass the test of describing the, the, the research tool and the discovery tool? You use those two terms, which I appreciate. Is there anything else you want to add about the Hue program? Uh, well, Hue's goal is to look at ways to study the built environment virtually. Uh, so we look at um, traditional library resources like archives and research resources like print publications or print options and visual options and ways to combine them into tools to study the built environment virtually. And Jason's project was a real natural segue for us to kind of expand beyond architecture and look at something um, more concrete regarding a different, uh, a different topic. I apologize, I've got a house full of kids and cats, so. <laughs> no, that's okay, and I put you on the spot. You know, I think that 
This is a continuation of Jennifer's work along with Hugh, but as you'll see, it's also pushing both of us in a new direction. It's forcing me to do this sort of like digital engagement, but I think Hugh has really looked at, especially Rome and South, in terms of South Bend, especially in terms of much more, much older, more historic built environment. Seaside, not so um, his, as historic as the other, but also like, architecturally very significant. So I think we are both pushing each other uh, in new directions in this um, amazing collaboration that we have. Jennifer and I, I think, have also worked on these three non-negotiables for our project. Uh, Jennifer has been adamant that the project must be bilingual. We want to make all of our resources available in English and Spanish, especially because we're working and really in the service of a migrant population that we want to make sure um, can engage with it. We also want to make sure that the project can never be monetized. Um, we have had tremendous success in securing external funding, largely so that we never have to charge for an app or we never have to charge for transcripts or any form of information. This is part of Jennifer's mis life's mission as a librarian, of course, but it's also really great for us that um, because there are many factors um, that want to monetize the murals. There was a famous case a few years ago of um, kind of a double-decker bus tour that was starting operations in Pilsen. And they were, they were intending to charge 60 to $75 a head for Pilsen mural tours. And the community went nuts because they said, you absolutely cannot commodify and monetize uh, the murals. And they actually shut down, th activism shut down the double-decker bus tour, which of course uh, I was cheering for from about 100 miles away. We also of course want to make sure that all of our information is open and accessible to all, always and forever. I mentioned a collaboration with the National Museum of Mexican Art. I'm going to kind of skip through a couple of slides um, in order to get moving along a little bit. But I want to talk for the next maybe five or ten minutes about what we've accomplished so far. These are really the building blocks of this material of this project in the earliest phases. Uh, the first thing that we've done is we've worked to build relationships with Pilsen cultural workers. We have digitized digitized uh, archival images. Um, I can see Irma in uh, the window. Uh, Irma and I. Irma was the first intern for this project, and she and I went to the Chicago History Museum. Uh, about a year and a half ago now, believe it or not, and we went looking for any archival images related to the murals of Bilson. We thought, hey, I mean, these are like culturally significant works of art that are right on the street. Certainly, this is a wing of the Chicago uh, History Museum, and we found exactly nothing uh, in the entire museum related to um, Pilsen murals, uh, which was surprising and not surprising for various reasons. If you think, consider, you know, how archives get built and who can, and what is considered um, archivally important. Um, however, uh, we met a few weeks later with the good people at the Chicago Public Art Group, who, which, unlike the archive, was a very different operation. Who opened up their um, metal cabinets to us and said, "Look, we have hundreds of slides of Pilsen," and uh, they incredibly were generously allowed us have allowed us to digitize uh, several dozen archival images that are just completely priceless to us. The, the thing that's really surprised me is that the people at the, the CPAG, the Chicago, Chicago Public Art Group, had no idea this stuff was here. Uh, you're looking at murals that are, are almost completely uh, disappeared. So these are a tremendous uh, source that I think will be built into the uh, web part of it especially. We started conducting the first ever comprehensive survey of public art in Pilsen. So again, to our amazement, uh, we have learned that there is not a, a place to go. Despite Irma's extensive uh, looking, uh, searching, there has not been one singular place to go to look for information. So mostly in conjunction with a class that I taught and in, in conjunction with Jennifer's team, uh, that was tremendously helpful in helping us figure out the technology part of it. We've started mapping murals. These are every little dot that you see is an entry that a student in a class that I taught uh, last spring called uh, Latinx muralism in Chicago. They have sort of manually entered uh, murals all over and have documented hundreds of murals in the Pilsen neighborhood. This is a little bit of a closer up view. So you can see the little blue dot is an address that we put in and then each red dot is a student who is on either Wi-Fi or probably, you know, um, uh, using their, their cellular data and they're, they're entering information as you'll see on the bottom there of a survey about the mural. So we're trying to sort of comprehensively uh, tally what is in the, um, what is actually on the walls all over Pilsen. 
Uh, we're also in the process of conducting long form interviews with Pilsen artists. Here are four of them that we conducted. Uh, I, Irma, I think you were on all of these. Um, we conducted these last spring and we, I, uh, I conducted with a uh, newer intern uh, one more uh, last week and we're gonna, we're moving into, we're re-entering the phase of interviewing. And these are four artists. There's Sam Kirk on the upper left. There's uh, Hector Duarte on the upper right, Miguel Darriel on the lower right, and Marcos Raya, the cool guy in the shades on the lower left. The, the interviews, I have to say, are one of my favorite aspects of the project. They've been really fun and they've continued to be great um, even though we've pivoted to Zoom. They have described their hopes and dreams for the neighborhood. Uh, they, they have uh, told us how they've become working artists themselves. They have told us a ton of chisme, which is uh, academically significant, of course. Uh, and they've also told us their gripes and frustrations with how the neighborhood has changed. Um, by making the transcripts of these interviews available to the general public in English and Spanish, and especially to students, uh, we hope to go beyond the usual sound bites that, that, they, that people can read in published interviews. All, these four have all done um, have all done interviews, extensive interviewing, but there's never been a place where you can go and look and find like long form interviews that go far beyond the sound bite. When I think about these artists that we've spoken to, one thing that always strikes me is just how different they all are and how we can choose any topic related to muralism in Pilsen and get very different answers. So I want to give you just one quick example. On the, the lower half of the screen, you, say, you see Miguel de Real standing in front of his incredible uh, Virgin of Guadalupe that is on Walcott. And then you see Marcos Raya in his studio on the lower left. One subject that comes up in every interview is the subject of community input. You're a muralist. Murals obviously rely on the community to, um, to say what they want on their walls. And these two had radically different answers. Miguel de Riel on the lower right, it, uh, he, sa he said he, he is so hypersensitive to community feedback that when he was painting the Virgin's face originally, someone walked by and said, hey, why did you get the, give the virgin duck lips? Like, is she posing for a selfie or what? And he revised it on the spot. He totally changed her facial structure based on um, a passerby. Marcos Raya on the left, who's a famous Pilsen artist, um, who has one of the biggest personalities I've ever encountered, which is saying a lot, considering I work in the field of Latino studies and I work with Luis Fraga. Um, he uh, he uh, has a huge personality. And he said, we ask him very delicately, very gingerly ask him about community feedback. He's like, community feedback? No, F these people, I'm the artist, my vision matters. I'm the one who tells them what this looks like. I will, you know, I'll, I'll tell the community what they need to see. And it was so fascinating to me that you have artists, Sam Kirk and Hector Duarte who are on top, They're, they take kind of a middle of the road. They both work extensively with community members, with community organizations. They get feedback, they revise, they go back to community meetings and everything. But there's, that's just one example of a kind of internal diversity among the Pilsen artists that we've been getting in these interviews, which I find really fascinating. Okay, I will breeze through this. These are just other ways, other things that we've done uh, to continue to get this project underway, developed a social media present. I mentioned the class. We've also spent some time dark, documenting artist studio. This is the studio of uh, the aforementioned Marcos Raya of the huge personality. He has one of the most interesting, weird studio spaces you'll ever see. And uh, Jennifer and her team have really incredible tools. Uh, this is like a bad, you know, like compression, but they have amazing tools that where uh, eventually on the user end, whether it's the app or the website, the user will be able to sort of go into the studio and look around through 360 degree photography and panoramas and stuff. It's really, you could zoom in and look at an object and zoom back out and turn around. They got the ceiling, which also has some weird art on it. And um, <laughs> so this is one of the, the, one of my favorite toys and we've just kind of gotten started um, in terms of documenting artist studios. In the interest of time, I'm going to close by talking about some challenges and questions. I think a more generous soul should have said um, person, uh, should have said um, opportunities, uh, because these are some of the things that we have faced coming in. The first one I'll mention, which is 
not very politically correct is to talk about cultural workers as gatekeepers. By cultural workers, I mean museum professionals, tour guides, people who have really devoted themselves to studying and relaying information about the murals. But one of the things that's very interesting to me about cultural workers is they, is that they also often function as gatekeepers. I, I want to say that the National Museum of Mexican Art is a fortress in terms of access, accessing what happens behind the scenes, but they have been incredibly nice and welcoming um, to us. However, um, Irma, I'm still looking at you just because you're first on my screen, but uh, we've also found that some people have approached us with a lot of skepticism and have, have treated themselves as the people who can protect artists from outsiders. And that has been really a tricky thing to navigate and negotiate as we work on the project. When I think about the artists we've interviewed, when I think about these four, when I think about other artists that we've met and worked with, they don't really seem to me like they need any protection from you know, evil academics and their interns, but um, this has been something that we've come across a lot. Um, I mentioned this, this, this issue that I was having in, at a meeting of the, the Whiting Foundation and they didn't like it. My colleagues who re also received the same grant as me said, you can't, like cu cultural workers are angels. They're the ones who, who do all the work on the ground. And I, I do see that point. We, we've met so many great people who have helped make this project um, uh, advanced to the state that it's in, but it's also this tricky thing that I think people do with artists as if they are a vulnerable and protected class of people who somehow need protection from outsiders. Um, this, is, this has been a tricky thing to navigate. Another very tricky thing to navigate is the issue of gentrification. Um, every artist and cultural worker that we've met with is highly concerned about the issue of gentrification. And as you might know, if you've been paying attention to development or even real estate prices in Chicago, um, Pilsen is currently in the crosshairs of the gentrification issue. Pilsen's a great location. It's, it's very close to, to the loop. It's very close to the lake. It's right on the pink line. Uh, Pilsen has been the subject to gentrification, and it's something that a lot of people are talking about in, in their art. I think if I had to give just one example of what's going on with gentrification, I'd have to talk about Casa Aztlan, uh, which was also the subject of a fantastic senior thesis that I advised two years ago by a wonderful student named Marie Fazio, who was an American Studies graduate. Um, Casa Aztlan, as I learned from Marie, was decades, an important and thriving cultural center in Chicago, completely nonprofit, helped generations of immigrants navigate uh, life in the United States, life in the city, and it also was adorned with murals on two sides. You're only seeing the front here, but a few years ago, a real estate developer bought the building that had formerly housed Casa Azatlan. It was no longer um, the, uh, it was no longer a community center. It had been empty for a few years. But the first thing that that developer did is he is they painted it that generic gray that you see on every single condo project in Chicago and apparently every other big city. You know that like sort of like medium to dark gray that I'm talking about. Uh, so they painted over the murals almost immediately, which was very heartbreaking for members of the community and led to a tremendous outcry. Artists, activists, school kids took to the streets um, almost immediately to decry um, this especially as a symbol of gentrification and how the neighborhood was changing very rapidly in front of them. Um, this was more than a lot of locals could take and gentrification was already a problem in the neighborhood when it started and a lot of people saw this as the ultimate symbol of Pilsen's, um, Pilsen changing in terms of affordability to long-term uh, residents and accessibility to newer immigrants. Um, the owner of the building did um, commission several artists to restore the murals and bring them back. Uh, so there's a bit of a happy ending there, but I think that really the, the damage done by the painting over of Casa Aslan was largely symbolic because it's one of hundreds of, um, of buildings in the neighborhood that has really been subject to this type of um, predatory development. Sorry, let me say one more thing about gentrification. 
and it's a common question that I've gotten when I've described this project is how we could possibly build an app about these murals and not also be contributors to gentrification. This is something that we've thought about a lot. We've talked about a lot. We've cried a little over thinking about whether this project um, will will actually wind up contributing to gentrification. Another thing that surprised me in the interviews that we conducted is that the artists have really complex relationships to gentrification. I think it was easy for me to, as a non-resident of Pilsen to go in and like wag my finger about the neighborhood changing. But when you look at artists like um, Sam Kirk, like Hector Duarte, people who have been in the, the neighborhood for a long time, um, they have t helped, I think, give me a more nuanced view of gentrification. Several of them have been um, grateful for the changes in the neighborhood, that their work is getting more credibility, that they've seen more amenities come to the city. So I also have had to challenge my own conceptions. I still stand on the side that gentrification is a negative force in the city, uh, in inner city neighborhoods, but it, it is really complex when you put the artists in conversation with some of the activists who are, who are um, strongly ob objecting to gentrification right now. I know I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll mention just a couple other challenges and questions. Uh, Jennifer and I have talked ad nauseum about drawing distinctions between muralism, graffiti, and commercial works. If we count every uh, advertisement and piece of wall art and piece of graffiti in Chicago, we will be in the tens of, th in Pilsen, we'll be in the tens of thousands and we can't cover everything. And the, the line between graffiti and muralism has been really challenging for us to think about. And I think I'll just close by saying one thing I've had to personally grapple with is kind of the ephemeral nature of, of Pilsen murals. I mentioned Kas Aslan as an example of a, of a mural that was there and then not there. I'll mention a couple other ones. This was a mural by Jeff Zimmerman uh, with community input that was on the, the side of a tortilla factory celebrating um, the women workers at that tortilla factory. I happen to think this is a beautiful piece, uh, but I was heartbroken when I was on sabbatical in Colombia and I started reading in the news and several people were messaging me that it was painted over with a much more mundane um, tortilla advertisement. Uh, I consider this a, a really fine work of art. So to see it covered up with sort of the traditional, you know, Aztec on a mountaintop, you know, was, was really heartbreaking. And I'll close visually with this mural, which is another um, piece that Jeff Zimmerman created in collaboration with the community. This was, in, of all of the murals, uh, my favorite piece in the city because it very aggressively, this is done in the late 90s and was already aggressively uh, talking about immigrant detention, uh, uh, mass incarceration and how it affected Latinos at, uh, in the city and elsewhere. Really beautiful piece, I think, that was thought provoking every single time I took a group of students or friends or, or cultural workers uh, onto the streets of Chicago and to see it painted over with that generic uh, condo gray uh, as a, we did a few summers ago, or a couple of years ago was very, very heartbreaking. I would say um, to end on a positive note, one thing I can say is that every muralist that we've asked us about and, and, and the museum professionals that we've talked to uh, are totally at peace with the fact that <laughs> murals are ephemeral in nature. They are there to be uh, painted over. It is not, they are not meant uh, for permanent display. Uh, and the fact that they're not under the protection and climate control of a museum uh, means that not only gentrification, but also social factors and weather, uh, as you can see, this one was already aging at the time that we took this picture, uh, played a role in making this mural disappear. So we're, we're strategizing of how to make this app sort of and website sort of dynamic in terms of looking at what was there and what's gone without being just a mural memorial site. So with that said, I'd love to take questions. I think there might be something in the chat or we can raise hands. Uh, if you don't mind, Paloma, I'll take the first question, which is from Maricel. Hi, Maricel. Sure. Hey. Um, hi. Oh, you're Thank there. You hi, you? Thank you for this. Thank you. It's fascinating. Uh, I, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I'm a sucker for murals. I love them. I love to take pictures of them. And, you know, anyway, I, I love this project. Um, so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about 
the importance of creating an archive of these murals. Um, and you kind of touched on this, honestly, um, over the, or throughout your talk, but um, the importance of creating an archive of the murals in light of the challenges, again, such as gentrification. Um, I was thinking of weather, you know, like the ephemeral nature of, of murals, which you just touched on, uh, the tendency to undervalue street art. I mean, um, especially, you know, in terms of Latino communities. So I don't know. Like, I think it's wonderful that you are creating this archive uh, with your team. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, thank, thank you for that. It's, it's interesting to think about because one of the things that I think a lot of the artists have talked with us about already and, and other cultural workers is around issues of legitimacy that they want to make sure that they are known as fine artists. And I think that the lack of information, the lack of very serious critical attention that they've gotten, that includes scholarship, that includes museum practices, has really meant that some that um, artists feel undervalued as in terms of working artists. Um, I mean, we interviewed Marco Soraya over maybe five hours total, and he he yelled at us about this for at least two of those hours about not getting the respect he deserves. I love the guy. He's a, he's, he's a pussycat at the end of the day, but um, I think he is articulating something very important. He's talking about the fact that people think real art is in the museum, which is behind walls, it's climate controlled, it's curated by professionals, and the, and, but street art is the fun stuff that is merely um, aesthetic or um, mood enhancing in terms of giving Pilsen a uh, Latino vibe. And I think what part of my mission, I can't speak for Jennifer there, but I think part of my mission is to say these are legitimate works of art. Pilsen artists are legitimate, are legitimate artists and, um, a lot of people that we've approached about this project have said like, I've been waiting for someone to come along and do this kind of work and to take it, take this art seriously. Yeah. So that's why they've done stuff like open their studios and their own personal archives to us. Mm -hmm. I didn't have them in a slide, but uh, Hector Duarte, who is this genius artist from Michoacan, who if you've ever been in Pilsen and noticed the building that is the wraparound vision of Gulliver, it was the first slide in my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he uh, has, he's, He's going to allow us to, to scan his entire um, studio, which is also his living space upstairs. Wow. Um, he loves to tell the story that it was, um, it started, when he bought it, it was a defunct bar called the Pink Poodle, and he made it, he made it truly, I think, the cornerstone of Pilsen. I think, like, if there's downtown Pilsen, I think it's that work, the Gulliver work um, on, um, eight, on 19th and Walcott. Um, you know, and he part of I think part of his generosity with us, a bunch of you know nerds from a hundred miles down the toll road, is that um, he uh, appreciates that we're asking, which yeah. is really surprising. Jason, there are a couple of more questions in the chat. Uh, one is from Catherine, and she asks if there are plans to update the app in an ongoing way in the future, given the volatility of the scene you've just pointed out. Hi, Catherine. Uh, I'm so glad you joined us. Um, this could be another eight hour presentation to talk about. Um, this could have been like number five under challenges. Um, there will be a day, believe it or not, when I'm, you know, I'm no longer doing this, that Jennifer is no longer doing this. And I think that's sort of like um, the updating is a really big question. There's several different approaches. We can kind of set it in amber we, on our launch date a couple of years from now, and we could say, this is what muralism was in 2022, and this was forever to represent that. Or we could create a system in which it's also updatable by users, uh, which I really think is where the future is going. So if you're in front of a mural that's no longer there, if the app is telling you that, there's, that you're standing in front of a mural and you're not, you can submit a picture of what the wall looks like that day that you're standing in front of it. So it would eventually sort of like, it's a Frankenstein moment, like, it's alive, it's alive. Like that would be the moment in which um, I think the app would really take on a life beyond uh, me and the Hue team. Jennifer, do you want to weigh in on that about like updating or? I, I can tell you that we are building a tool that is easily updatable. Uh, we hope that uh, when we are complete with an interface that you'll be able to um, kind of change the content of the app every day. 
So for example, um, we're, we're building in one custom tour, one uh, scripted tour to start with, but eventually you'll be able to say, I want to focus just on works of art around gentrification and you'll be able to build your own tour. So it is, it is actually a customizable template that we are designing. So we do hope to be able to update and modify it um, regularly. It's such a good question, Catherine, and anyone else who's thinking about it. And I think it also speaks to kind of the, the relationship that I have with the Hue team. There were a couple, there was a, a while there when I was saying to Jennifer, like, the, what do you get out of this? Like, I've, you know, like I get to study these murals and, and relay information about the murals. And her answer was so great because what she was saying, the Hue team, they have an ulterior motive. Like they are using me. Like I, you know, like because in, in the best possible way, because what they're truly building is like open source software. Stop me if I get any of this, of the technological terms wrong, Jennifer, but they're building software uh, that will help academics and the public build apps for themselves. Building an app, as Jennifer says all the time, the average cost is about half a million dollars to build an app. This, their bigger mission is to democratize that and to create a system in which if you don't have half a million dollars, you can use this open software to build an app for yourself. So uh, if you're teaching a class on not murals, but anything, uh, you can build an app for yourself. So to, to add on to that, the, the website and the app work together as a, as a tool, a research tool and a discovery tool. The content in the website can be taken and directly inputted into the mobile application. And what we're building is a template so that anybody with um, a, a set of research resources and geographic location can build their own website and related mobile applications. So that is our end goal. And we are using JSON to do that and very happily so. This project has been on my list of ideas for more than 10 years. So it's, we're very excited to be working with Jason to figure out a way to how how to not just look at buildings but to look at what's on the buildings or what's in the buildings what's around the buildings or he's using the buildings so there's there's a there is a goal for us as well definitely thank you Jason there is a pre-submitted question from an educator and a Notre Dame alumnus in Texas I think she was on this call she says I see something similar in my neighborhood what can I do to do something like your project in Pilsen it's huh, a very interesting question. I would say the first thing you can do is just get interested in the public art around you. Like, honestly, I came to this project. This is not, this is a side project for me. This is my, my little side hustle. Um, I first came, became interested in this project simply as a fan, as a fan of public art. You know, Maricel mentioned, you know, like being a fan. Uh, I was right there with her. So I don't claim some sort of like magical expertise. I it beyond curiosity. And um, it's, it's interesting for me as a scholar that really both parts of what we've talked about are, are not that interpretive in terms of what we're trying to build. We're, I'm not trying to build an interpretive apparatus to tell people what the murals mean. We're trying to build uh, technological or digital platforms that simply put information in front of users and really anyone who's curi curious. Um, I can give one piece of advice to whoever asked that question, which is um, talk to artists directly. That has been a very gratifying thing. Uh, and if you can, it, most murals are tagged, most now with an Instagram handle. And I would say, um, oh, speaking of that, I should say, um, contact us and follow us. Um, <laughs> um, if, are, these artists are eager to talk about their work. So they might not, but uh, I would say try talking to the artists themselves. One faculty member asks online if there are any alliances between artists, say Mexican, American, and Puerto Rican artists that are using a unified voice against gentrification. That's a really great question. Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, because Pilsen is, has long been understood and seen as a Mexican American neighborhood. It's always been more complex th than that. There's always been Puerto Ricans in Pilsen. There's always been African Americans. There's always been um, Afro Latinos in the, the Pilsen neighborhood. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to overstate the Mexicanness of Pilsen, but that really is kind of, I think, the stereotype and the idea of 
Pilsen. Um, however, all of this bleeds into each other. Sam Kirk, who I mentioned as an artist, um, uh, the intern Isaac Heller and I just interviewed Sandra uh, Anton Giorgi. Uh, they're both have Puerto Rican heritage, but they're Pilsen artists. So Pilsen, I think, has been a big tent far beyond Mexican Americanness. Uh, for its entire history. It's always been sort of a racial alliance uh, creating the murals of Pilsen. Uh, and then I see with the artists, you know, Hector Duarte is Mexican American, but there's no way he could survive on just painting Pilsen. His work is all over Chicago. Uh, if you see, uh, if, you're, if you're in Chicago and you see an, a metal butterfly sticking out of a building, I bet you it was Hector Duarte. He's been all over Pilsen for, or all over Chicago for a very long time. So we have to put some limits on this project because we can't study the tens of thousands of public art pieces in the city of Chicago. Um, but, so we've limited to Pilsen, but it actually is more diverse than just um, Mexican American. So I, I really appreciate that question and I really see it as kind of an international, inter-ethnic, intercultural alliance that really puts these works, you know, hey, I might as well talk about like what's right in front of me, which is this work, which is Weaving Cultures by Sam Kirk and Sandra Anton Giorgi. There, this piece, which was done a few years ago, is a response to one of the oldest uh, surviving Pilsen murals, which is called uh, Museo del Barrio, which is the profile of um, four or five men. Um, so I love the story of this mural because uh, they wanted to create a mural that's a response to sort of this, let me be honest, machista approach to saying this is the, this is the neighborhood uh, that was done in the 70s when machista politics ruled. So they created this peach, which is kind of a feminist response to it. Um, they're very explicit about the fact that it, um, they wanted to represent the internal diversity of, of Latinas. So they included a trans Latina, an Afro Latina, a Latina wearing a hijab. They, they wanted, they really were after, um, they were after um, that internal diversity and reflecting the fact that Pilsen has, al has always been all mixed up, even though, you know, it's famous for Mexican food. Um, one of my very favorite um, aspects of this piece is the fact that before they embarked on painting this piece, they actually touched up the piece and restored the piece that they are openly kind of responding to and criticizing with this piece. Uh, and that, I really love that part of the story because it says that they were not, they were not adamant about sort of destroying their ancestors and their, their, their predecessors on the streets of Pilsen. They're simply adding to the reflection of who Pilsen is and what it stands for. And I think, this is a particularly beautiful representation of how they're adding adding to it by acknowledging the, the diversity of the neighborhood. We have two more questions, Jason. One is from a faculty member and she asks, what is the relationship between outsiders, you know, between visitors and the artists that are there? Are visitors influencing their content? Do they have ethnic expectations of what should be on these murals? Yeah. That's a really good question. And, and a lot of the people that we've interviewed, not just the five big interviews that I've mentioned, but other people that we've talked to all over Pilsen, including artists that we haven't been able to sit down for an interview yet, they have said that there is a conflict between their artistic vision and what tourists and hipsters want out, what they want Pilsen to be. So, um, I think this is a really good example. Th th these are two um, working artists. Sandra has moved her studio to Cicero, but Sam Kirk still has a studio in Pilsen. These are two formerly or currently Pilsen-based artists who are trying to represent their point of view. And uh, what Marcos Raya calls it is taco art, uh, constantly. He says what the tourists want is taco art. They want stuff that is stereotypically Mexican-American. Um, in order to make them feel like they're having a cross-cultural experience. And he does not dabble in taco art, what he calls taco art. Sam Kirk and Sandra uh, don't dabble in taco art uh, because they don't have to, because they're highly successful commissioned, uh, off, uh, highly commissioned uh, working artists. That's a bit of a privilege on uh, all of their parts because a lot of the new stuff that goes up in Pilsen uh, every time I go back is, uh, tends to be more commercial in nature. And we've been really been trying to think about um, what counts as 
true Pilsen muralism. I think a good example of that, um, okay, I, I should not be so sassy, but I can't help it, is that um, there's a, a hipster taco place that opened in Pilsen underneath the pink line called Frida's. And they're, um, they're, they commissioned a mural prior to their grand opening, which is a huge, beautiful Frida Kahlo. And the Pilsen artists that we talked to, the museum professionals, they roll their eyes so hard at that because Frida is, Frida's an, an incredible, brilliant artist, but she has become such a, a, a symbol. She's been, she's been so co-opted that she's become a symbol of like the hyper-commercialization of Mexicanness. And that also happens in Pilsen a lot. So a lot of the people that we talked to, I say this because like when I was actively working in Pilsen before COVID, uh, a lot that piece was going up and they talked about, um, a lot of them were throwing shade at the, um, at the, as, at the Frida as taco art. That is a conflict and it is related. I, I think it's what might've been Sarah's question because I could see the chat. Um, it is related to all of the stuff the commercialization of art. It is also about gentrification. It's about tourism. It's about so much that's happening on the streets of Pilsen. And I really see muralism as an archive of in and of itself documenting these dynamics. Um, I should mention, I'm not also against commercialism in art. Sam Kirk, who's the co-painter of this piece, is also, she, a lot of her work is advertisements, you know, in, in the city for, um, you know, I'll give you an example, like Major League Soccer um, commissioned her to paint a piece that's on 18th Street. It's very prominent in Pilsen of, of, of soccer players. Uh, she, she, of course, makes a living off of, off of commercializing her art, but she then also gets to do the fun stuff. I mean, this is also a commission, but it's a commission from a, a, from a cultural source. So she gets to also do the fun stuff of displaying her point of view. Thank you for that. Our last question is from a faculty member as well, who asks, how do you integrate digital technology into, into your pedagogy and how do you get students <laughs> to be co-creators of it? I call Jennifer and try to be super sweet and ask her and her team, including James, to come to my class and tell my students how to do it. So <laughs> I see that this question is from Katie Walden, who is my beloved colleague, uh, new colleague in American Studies. Uh, she's going to be getting some phone calls about how to do some of this stuff uh, myself. But I think um, I think that part of why this project works is because I am right brain and Jennifer has assembled a left brain that does the technological part of it. So I do very little of it. Paloma, can I ask answer one question that I saw in the chat before? Yes, you, of course. I just wanna say there was a question about, um, about engaging more community members with the project. And that's something that we absolutely mm. want and hope to do along the way. This project has been like me and some interns going to, going to Chicago whenever we can, but one of the partnerships that is built into the funding structure from the Whiting Foundation is also a partnership with the Pilsen Alliance, which is an activist group um, that's actively uh, anti-gentrification. Their, their, their main project right now is that they're working on not, they're, they're trying to force the city to not give Pilsen historically protected status, which is kind of counterintuitive because you think that an activist group would want the city to protect Pilsen, but what would come along with that protected status would make it very difficult for current homeowners to repair and upgrade their homes. So they're act to my amazement and and awe, and I'm very impressed by the fact that they're actively um, rejecting um, protected status for Pilsen right now, which is pretty cool, but also dangerous from a preservation perspective. <laughs> Hashtag, it's complicated. Uh, that was all to say, the Pilsen Alliance is, is one of those points in which we're gonna be down the road engaging more community members, especially once we have sort of um, um, mock-ups of the app going where we're gonna ask, be asking local people to help to contribute content to the app to the extent that they wish to. So that'll be really, really cool. And that'll be definitely the fun part that's coming up. Excellent, thank you so much. Luis? Let us all uh, give Jason an actual or virtual round of applause <laughs> for his excellent discussion and presentation. Thank you, Jason. We greatly, greatly 
benefited and learned about your work and the collaborative nature of your work and the importance of understanding murals in all of our communities, but especially in Pilsen. I want to remind everyone that we have uh, that our two upcoming events in our Hispanic Heritage Month speaker series. Um, one will be this coming Wednesday, October 7th, uh, where ILS faculty fellow and assistant professor of art history, Tatiana Reynosa, will examine the prints of Ecuadorian American artist Sandra Fernandez and her appeals for immigrant rights. And the title of her presentation is Dreamers on the Borderline, the Art of Sandra Fernandez. And then next week on Monday, also at four o'clock on Wednesday, October 7th, and then on Monday, October 12th at 4 p.m., my colleague in political science, David Cortez, an ILS faculty fellow, will discuss his work on Latinx immigration agents, and the title of his talk is Broken Mirrors, Latinx, La Migra, and the Conflict of Being Both. Thank you, Paloma, for all of your work to put this together. Thank you, Maribel, but again, thank you mostly to Jason for thank taking you. the time to do this. There's no compensation that our ILS faculty fellows <laughs> receive for this. <laughs> they do it to share their work and to help us better understand aspects of their work, but also aspects of Latino life and culture during this period of Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you to all of the 28 participants who are with us. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us, and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Good evening, everyone.